You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. In this week's program, we interview Leo Igwe, the founding member of the Nigerian Humanist Movement. We'll also be talking about elections in Iran, ongoing atrocities by ISIS, child marriages in Lebanon, the kindness walls, Valentine's Day and immorality, as well as doctors protesting in defense of child asylum seekers. Don't go away, stay with us. On February 26th, there's going to be elections in Iran. It is for the assembly of experts, people who will elect the supreme spiritual leader, as well as the Islamic Assembly. And the funny thing is that while there are people celebrating it as an election, the Ministry of Interior has issued the final list of those who are allowed to partake and participate in these elections. And if what you, a joke. If you name this election, and I think it really bores me to death, if you name, uh, you know, name it election is just greatest insult to people of Iran and everybody else. And there are herd of journalists, and I <laughs> refer to herd actually, uh, uh, journalists who try to justify this, or people who are supposedly academic, you know, the Bashi in, the Bashi in, in, in Columbia yes. University, trying to compare this with the United States, say, look, there's corruption over here, there's corruption here. He never talks about the fact that the previous candidate uh, in the um, election before last is still in house arrest and he's actually dying, he's not allowed to see anybody. If you disagree with these lot, you know, you disappear. Even when you're their friends, you Absolutely. disappear. So you can imagine what happens to people who are not their friends. Yeah, and people, a, a lot, lot worse. People in Iran do not have the choice to decide their own destiny mm. and you know, choose what the, who they want to send to parliament I, or, I, or any part of the state uh, or executive power. And it's interesting because what happens is a, a dictatorship, a, theoc a theocracy, decides that, you know, this is an election, we're going to call it election. And a lot of journalists and others buy into it, and experts buy into it, and they talk about how great it will be if reformers will, you know, stay in power, or and then when nothing happens and, you know, the human rights violations continue, then they say, well, you know, reformers don't really have any power. So which is it? You know, you're happy that they're in power, or they don't have any power. Either way, it's a system that's set up against people's rights. And, you know, we, we're hearing a lot about what's happening in ISIS-held territories as well. You know, a lot of people will say the Iranian regime is better, but if you look at their laws, fundamentally they're very similar, aren't yeah, they? Imagine if you go to uh, um, ISIS-held territory and they start talking about election people deciding who the <laughs> leader is. It's just crazy. <laughs> the whole thing is, is, you know, it's just against human beings and people don't have the right to choose. I mean, that's the key. Journalists, do you get this or not? <laughs> they don't get yeah. it. It's, it's like... Yeah. Uh, and of course, when we're talking about ISIS, I think there's been a couple of things in the news which are really, really heartbreaking. And it just goes to show how vile this movement is. There's a story recently of a 15-year-old boy who was sitting in his dad's shop listening to uh, music, pop music on his, iP you know, on his uh, disc player. And they caught him and they've beheaded him for doing that. I mean, it's, it's just every day we see and we hear uh, about atrocities of ISIS and what they do, it just is, it goes beyond belief. Yeah. And there are some people who they think they can negotiate with these lot. Yeah. That that makes yeah. me sick. Yeah. I mean, the other sort of part of ISIS activities, you know, they start sort of training kids, recruiting kids, just for uh, um, you know sending them to become uh, missiles effectively. Yeah. yeah, I mean, human life is yeah. expendable to the Islamists. You've got uh, one young. A uh, boy who was uh, also executed because he missed Friday prayers. There are reports now of four women who have recently been stoned in Mosul as well, charged with adultery, though there's no news of the men and uh, there are allegations by activists that it, in fact it was uh, women who were raped by the jihadis who are now being stoned. So there's lots of these sort of, you know, unrelenting, unrelenting brutality and violence against ordinary people. Many of those very people are people who are fleeing. Let's not forget that. Um, now, of course, one of the other um, areas which um, Islamic states excel in is child uh, marriages, which is legalized pedophilia. 
Uh, there was a wonderful uh, video, though, of a campaign called um, Enough in Lebanon by um, children's rights activists yeah. there. Yeah. And what did they do? Tell the audience about that I video. I think they, they just uh, uh, had a, a mock sort of marriage between an older man and a, and a child, and they were recording, uh, you know, passers-by reaction to this incident and there were some people saying, oh, you know well done you've done very well and there were a lot of people actually were, s uh, were stopping and questioning what's going on you know yeah, you know you're a couple luggage. of people said this is criminal yes. what you're doing and you know the man was saying well her parents have approved and it was actually a photographer taking pictures yeah. of this child bride with this old man that was the age of her grandfather yeah. so it's raised a huge debate around child marriage issues uh, because obviously there's 37,000 child marriages a day 15 million girls every year and uh, the statistics say that an additional 1.2 billion child marriages will take place by 2050. So a huge, huge, huge issue. 40,000 under 15s, of course, in Iran alone in 2014. And it's interesting because whenever there, there are activists in these countries that want to change the laws, you come up with, of course, the religious clerics who keep saying no. You know, in Pakistan recently, they tried to ban it and the Islamic cleric said, you know, it's un-Islamic to ban it. Yeah, and and this is going on um, in in many many countries, and we need to sort of raise awareness and uh, campaign to end child marriage and protect children from the Islamist. Definitely, yeah. and just as a final thing, that's kind of an interesting piece of news is these kindness walls that mm. started in Iran, and then now we're hearing about them in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And basically, on the um, on the street corners, the walls called kindness wall. And people put things that they do not want, and other people come and take it away. And this is just growing in every city in Iran, and now it's been picked up in Pakistan and uh, in Afghanistan. So there's element of human solidarity, community activity, and organizing, and actually shows under the brutal rule of the Islamists and the reactionaries, people are coming together to protect each other. A while back, I met with Leo Igwe, who is the founder of the Nigerian Humanist Movement. Listen to this fantastic interview about witchcraft, the church, and children's rights. Stay with us. Hello, Leo. Welcome to the program. I wanted to ask you about, you know, Christianity's role in Nigeria and the issue of witchcraft uh, in particular. Yeah, um, Christianity's role is um, is on one part reinforcing the belief in witchcraft and another part presenting itself as a solution yes um, so we have a, a, a little bit of a complex situation there but at the end of it all Christianity is actually part of the problem yeah yeah but uh, the the early missionaries missionaries that came that evangelized in in, uh, in Nigeria and in many parts of Africa they, they did not emphasize so much on witchcraft because, of course, they were not Nigerians, they were not Africans. So, and they looked down on the cultural and religious beliefs of the people. So, and people have been using this as a way to say Christianity is, uh, um, the missionary Christianity did not support witchcraft. It's not true. They didn't even understand it in the first place. And they looked down on Nigerians and Africans as people with somehow primitive practices. So, but what happens is that the witchcraft narrative is part of Christianity too. So when the missionaries now left and all that, so local pastors and priests, they now took over the management of Christianity. So they now discovered some, some kind of commonality between Christian uh, uh, texts and of course the traditional beliefs. So that's how the reinforcement, you know, um, you know came, we come about the reinforcement. And it's now difficult to untangle because the, the priests and pastors are presenting themselves as people who have the power to identify and remove you know, witchcraft, spirit, whatever that means. So, and um, they have a way of turning every problem people have, giving it a kind of, using the idiom of witchcraft to interpret it. Because when they interpret it that way, they will now make you to understand, come to my church and I will deliver you. And those things that, that don't happen without people spending money and without people keeping, subjecting people to torture, inhuman and degrading treatment. And also uh, inciting people 
by equipping them with this, that kind of narrative to go home and identify such problem and sometimes perform deliverance on themselves. So sometimes people who can't take their children to these churches, they can say, yes, this is witchcraft. They will now have to torture that child. And sometimes the people they torture are weak members of the society. Many of them don't even know. And some of them are forced to accept that they are witches. Because, I mean, you, you are being told this by somebody more, more powerful, more learned, and someone who's supposed to guide you. So this is, this is how we've got into this vicious circle, and, and this is how Christianity is actually part of the problem and not the solution. I mean, you hear some real horror stories of the treatment of people who've been considered witches, even children. Can you explain a bit about that? Yeah, I, I think that the stories, um, they, there's, there's so many, because I have been involved in a lot, uh, for, for some time now in trying to rescue some of the children. And uh, we have, we have um, we, there were some children, they will be kept in a room and they'll be, they'll be flogging them. Sometimes they use machete on them, you know, this, not actually machete as in this, they use the side because just to make them feel the pain, you know, and make them cry. Sometimes they drive them out of the room in the night and some of them have to roam the streets, some of them have to trek distances, some of them have to sleep in the bush. So, and because there is a belief that torture, trial by ordeal, is a way to get the demon or to get the witchcraft out of people. So sometimes some of them starve them. You know, they keep them, they chain them, they put them on chains and they chain them and they, they don't give them food, you know. So this is a way to get the child either to confess or to stop that thing they have interpreted as witchcraft. Some of them, we have had cases where they pour uh, gasoline, you know, on them, yeah, it, and just throw them out. So, so they, it is difficult to capture the kind of torture because this thing happens to children and this thing happens behind the wall of silence. You know, and again, also believe because when it's happening in an environment, people don't want to get involved because they, they think that the witchcraft could also affect them. So they don't want to get involved in it. So the treatment they give them, I mean, is so horrible. Sometimes they, they just send the children out. There was a child I rescued that was around eight years old. She was driven out and she was sleeping in the market, you know, when I came to the village. So when I came to, the, uh, when I came to that village, they told me that one man came and took the girl and is sleeping with the girl. I mean, a girl of eight, 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 eight to nine years. So I was shocked. So they said that nobody wanted to go and take the child because taking, you can't take a child, they say it's a child witch. You, you can't take the child to your family because the belief is that it, it could infect the family and destroy the family. So there is this kind of people hardening their feelings and conscience towards them. They don't want to care for them. So I went, I rescued this child. I rescued this child, handed the child over to the government. Then the government took the child back to the father and the father sent the child away again. And the, the child now went back to that same man again. So I came back to the community. They told me the, 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 the child had gone back to the, the man. And all that. We had to go back for the second time and rescue this child. So it is difficult. Ch the children have very, you know, a lot of very horrifying stories of what they go through. But let us not forget that these are those who survived. <laughs> those who survived to tell their story. And as kids, there are people who didn't survive to tell their story. And for their sake, that is why the little uh, information we get and the situations we have, we're doing our best to see that, you know, the, the people who are behind it, that's the problem. The pastors, the spiritualists, the, the, the traditional mercy men and women, and parents also who have this belief and who go to, from one church to the other, looking for pastors to come and give them spiritual solutions to their problems. They are part of the problem. So by challenging them, by, you know, Holding them to account, I hope that we can, you know, at least reduce, you know, the suffering and eventually eradicate the problem. Do you think there is hope to eradicate it? Yes, there is. There is you see, there is hope. I, I don't think it's a hopeless situation because even when, when we travel to one village in Ibom State, we met one family that was that been trying to take care of the children, but there were many. There were around four or five, and this is a poor family. You know, they have get, they have lived very little income. So when they saw, they said, Ah, they have been looking out for people who could come around and help them handle this. There are people who are, you know, who you know who have this feeling for these children who would like to take care of them, but they are not sometimes given the um, opportunity. They don't have the support. So I think that if we are able to go out, keep speaking out. The little people who are interested in taking care of these children, who understand the scale of the problem, the scale of the abuse they go through, will form a groundswell and a critical mass, and I will be able to, you know, get the problem stopped eventually. You mentioned something interesting in your talk about how Africa has this image that it's all superstition and religion, but there's atheism and free thought there as well. Explain that. 
Yes, yeah, you know, because um, when you read the literature, when you read a lot of literature on witchcraft or religion, there's always this brush. You know, they used to paint all. Uh, they paint um, every African or the African continent. Yeah, it's deeply religious. It's deeply magical. And in fact, if you lead, read the early, early anthropologists like Levi Brew, they, they try to uh, see Africans as savages, and their thinking is magical. They don't reason. You know, and uh, you know, yes, if you are coming from outside the culture, there's a tendency for you to frame. You know, the thinking of a particular people in a, in a way. Because number one, you don't understand them. And number two, you are using the, the, the yardstick of your own culture to judge another culture. Okay. But meanwhile, these are also people who believe in Jesus, who believe in uh, that uh, God can turn into wafers and you can eat wafers and drink blood. I mean, they, they, they came with a more ridiculous, a more absurd belief. And they came to Africa and judged their own as barbaric and primitive. And at the end of the day, the problem we're having today is because they left a primitive belief or, or what they think is primitive, they try to remove it and replace it with another primitive and superstitious belief. So by, by, by saying that, it doesn't mean that we didn't have uh, rational oriented people in the West. Or we didn't have rational oriented people in, in, in Africa too. We had them, you know, but of course they were not given a voice and all that. So what we, what uh, today we are trying to make sure that people who are non-religious, people who are critical of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, witchcraft or magic and who live in Africa, they are given a voice and their voice are heard. Because right now, like now, if you look at the Northern Nigeria where we're having this problem, everybody might think that everybody, every Muslim there is a Boko Haram member or every person living there believes in what Boko Haram is to. It's not true. There are people who don't believe in what Boko Haram are doing. There are people who don't, there are Muslims who are critical of, of some of the beliefs. It, there, are, there are something, what I call cultural Muslims, there are, there are what I call Allah Muslims, there are what I call uh, uh, just religious Muslims and all that. There are so many different, uh, you know, different types of people depending on how they want to really express themselves. But sometimes they paint them with the same brush. So I think that there are critical, rational, uh, rational skeptical oriented people in the continent. And they should be given a voice. They should be given a voice because sometimes by giving them a voice, we understand how diverse you know, this, this, the, 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 uh, these places are. And it can also help us in our efforts, particularly if we want to address problems related to religion, superstition, or, um, or fanaticism. Thank you very much. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Leo Igwe. I think he raises some amazing, wonderful points about witchcraft, about the church's role in uh, Nigerian and African societies in general, as well as, you know, how much of a children's rights issue this is as well. Absolutely. Um, it's I think this was a wonderful interview, very short, in a short interview, he unfolds so many issues, both historical as well as the spread of this and the right of the children and the fact that there's a huge uh, movement in um, Africa and where there are church, there is church influence and people actually come together against this and this is driven constantly by the church organization. Yeah. There was this thing recently in the news, I don't know if you saw it, of a two-year-old who had been on the streets for the past eight months. I mean, how old is that child who had to fend for himself because he had been thrown out of his family's home uh, because he was accused of being a witch? And a, a, a Danish aid worker found him and then she, she placed him somewhere. But to think that, you know, because of some sort of superstition and belief in witchcraft that is also perpetrated by the church, you can actually throw out a child and very often people won't intervene because they're afraid to do so. And um, how Leo actually explains the relationship between this and the church establishment, that it's a money-making machine. Uh, you know, when people are labelled as uh, being um, devil, or possessed, and then immediately the person who um, sort of marks them up as such makes himself or herself available mm. to save them for a fee. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the that's the crux of the matter. Yeah. And we've had this issue of um, the role of church um, in abusing children through witchcraft in England as well. We remember Victoria Klimbier, and yeah. as a result of her tragic death. Um, the awareness of the issue was raised and now the police actually have a, a unit within Metropolitan Police who are investigating that. Last year up to uh, uh, October until uh, the Independent May, uh, uh, newspaper reported there were nearly 50 cases of uh, child abuse who actually police had to inter intervene 
and this is very directly related to the church and my question is that if there is a church that um, witchcraft through witchcraft uh, they, um, they, they, uh, they do um, child abuse they carry out child abuse why those churches are left open I think there should be people should be arrested yeah, definitely and those churches should be shut it down. is a really serious violation of children's rights and of course even in uh, is Islamic states you have this issue in Iran for example being a witch uh, carries the death penalty in Saudi Arabia I read something really interesting that you know the Commission for the promotion of virtue and the prevention of vice a really long name they actually underwent an anti-witchcraft uh, training for their they have an anti-witchcraft unit and it just goes to show how much you know this sort of um, use of witchcraft and accusations are used to both promote suppression and oppression of people's rights and particularly children are so vulnerable here yeah and uh, and Leo I think pay, make so many interesting point and one of that one of those point uh, was the fact that the um, society wants to protect children and there are a lot of people who, who come out but they're afraid and there's no such support for them so uh, and the fact that the humanist and rationalist sort of movement in Nigeria and many other countries are the true force to protect children here against the church influence a destructive influence of the church Last week we saw the celebration of Valentine's Day and of course it's a day where lots of people enjoy it. It's called a day of love, whatever. You might not like it, you think it's a Hallmark Day. Either way, it's a day lots of people enjoy it, give each other chocolates, go on dates and have fun. But of course, because a lot of people like it, who doesn't like it? All the right wing and the Islamists. It, yes, it seems to definitely. be, this year in particular there was a concerted effort across the uh, um, you know, Islamic rhythm societies and to some extent right wing sort of Hindu groups as well. Uh, for example, in, in Iran, this, to try to stop, it's very popular, um, uh, Valentine's Day in Iran, to try to stop and they issued sort of notices to everybody in coffee shops, you know, don't allow any uh, boys and girls coming in, you know, exchanging cards and flowers and gifts, you know. Because of uh, decadent Western culture. Yeah. And because obviously it brings immorality sex and alcohol, that's uh, what they in, think. In Pakistan, in one of the regions, uh, uh, Maulana, who's a sort of district administrator, another Maulana, what's up with the Maulanas? <laughs> he said, this, this day actually is very useless, he says. <laughs> <laughs> he says, this day is very useless. It's useless because you can't decapitate anyone, what's the point, <laughs> right? It's useless, and he said, actually, Valentine's Day has no legal basis. I mean, <laughs> yeah, legal, we legal, know that. Legal basis is, is the day that people celebrate. And he said um, that. But his fatwa against it has legal basis. He says exchanging gifts in any other day is fine, is on that day is not very good. <laughs> This is just and of course, crazy Islamists. As, as you said, it's not just the Islamists, uh, the Iranian regime, the Pakistani regime, uh, for example, has uh, you know told people not to celebrate it or tried, and then they've given up because people have celebrated anyway. You've got uh, also in Saudi Arabia, uh, there, there was this news last year, if you remember, where five Saudi men were given 39 years imprisonment and 4,500 lashes for dancing with women during Valentine's Day. So it's actually quite serious. Um, and of course, uh, I don't know if you saw videos of the Hindu right wing, their, their goons, you know, attacking people who were celebrating, yeah. beating people up for celebrating Valentine's Day. But, you know, people make, you know, a comment about Valentine's Day, but our positions uh, um, <laughs> about Valentine's Day is celebrate it, enjoy it, do a lot more, <laughs> just because the Islamists and the right wing don't like it. Do more. It's not useless. It's very good. <laughs> the wonderful slice of like life this week is from Australia, and it is about doctors protesting to defend the rights of child asylum seekers. There's a story of baby Asha. She was born in Australia. She is an Australian citizen, supposedly, 
born to asylum seeking parents. The doctors have said, well, you know, she needs to be released from hospital. They are refusing to release her because the government is going to send her back to Naura Detention Center, which the doctors say is a violation of, of child rights. It is an act of torture because the conditions in these detention centers are so bad. It amounts to abuse and torture. Absolutely. And the beautiful action of the doctors to refuse to discharge the baby has actually, has actually created a, a movement in Australia and created a, you know, a beautiful face of Australia. It's created a, a beautiful slice of life. Yeah, there's definitely been vigils uh, outside the hospital for uh, over a week now. And also, it, it sort of reminds me of the pilots who refuse to fly a plane with asylum seekers who are being deported back to a country where they face persecution. So this sort of human solidarity is just really wonderful to see in the face of so many attempts to close borders and to decriminalize asylum seekers and refugees. Well done, Australia. Anyway, we reached the end of our program. Before we go, we want to thank those of you who have donated to our program, especially our patrons who donate on a weekly basis. We really, really appreciate it. We also love getting your comments on YouTube, on Facebook, and via social media. So do keep those coming. Anyway, we hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.